Hey, I'm gonna go ahead and call our meeting of the city council special meeting for Tuesday, July 9th to order. Uh, Madam City Car Clerk, would you call the roll please? Mayor Christy Malchow. Present. Deputy Mayor Karen Moran. Council Member Tom Hornish. Present. Council Member Jason Ritchie. Council Member Chris Ross. Present. Council Member Pamela Stewart. Here. Council Member Romero Valderrama. Okay, Madam City Clerk, we have a quorum, barely. <laughs> Hopefully the rest will uh, show up here. Okay, um, I need a motion for approval of the agenda, but before we do that, I, we need to reverse order of a couple of items. So the King County Comprehensive Solid Waste Plan, the gentleman who's presenting is stuck in traffic. So if I can get someone to move the Zaku Space plan, Basin Plan up in its place. I make a move. Okay, it's been moved. Second. Okay, and seconded. Okay, um, so all those in favor of the agenda as amended say aye. I'm sorry, aye. Just, aye. just gonna aye. around yeah. in just the first two items flipped. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, aye. Okay, by a vote of, I think that was 5-0, uh, we will amend that agenda. So that means we will move to public comment. Uh, this is an opportunity for the public to address the council. Three minute limit per person or five minutes of representing the official position of a recognized community organization. If you would like to show a video or PowerPoint, it must be submitted or emailed by 5 p.m. at the end of business day to the city clerk, Melanie Anderson at manderson at sammamish.us. Please be aware that council meetings are videotaped and available to the public. First, I have Mark Cross, followed by Karen Herring. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Malcho, city council members. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, the council for some of the additions that were made to the draft uh, Zacus Basin Plan. Um, I like that you're thinking about the basin holistically and are open to not only the drainage challenges along some of the roads, but also some of the actual uh, sidewalk and bicycle lane uh, needs potentially in the future so that the, those are brought to people's memory fresh when uh, the basin plan comes up again. Uh, some of the uh, issues that the basin plan asks you to address, I think are gonna unravel for you over a longer period of time. I know that in the fall you have a meeting scheduled and I appreciate that as well with the water districts to talk about um, their um, plans, what they're really planning to do, uh, under what circumstances they do it. I think you'll have a lot of uh, questions about uh, how do we get uh, pockets of the city that are 40 and 50 years old that are, are on septic tanks that maybe need to transfer over to sewer. How does that happen? How can we make it happen? Are there grants available? How can we do this and not make it a, you know, a gift of public funds? You'll have a lot of questions, but it'll also will help establish uh, probably some of the difficult limits that you'll have in finishing out the utility infrastructure for the city of Sammamish. Uh, we are inside the urban growth boundary. Uh, I personally live uh, what will be five short miles to uh, Sound Transit. Um, this area is going to be under more pressure uh, in the future if that's even imaginable. Um, but uh, finishing out the urban infrastructure, roads, sewer, storm drainage uh, is gonna be very important and understanding what the sewer districts, water districts can do, will do, want to do maybe what they think their limits are is gonna help you understand what your limits are going to be, particularly uh, that'll help inform the uh, land use plan that you're gonna do. Uh, I would note that uh, in the Zacus Basin, you have a uh, wetland at the bottom of the, the road, I think it's wetland number five, that's actually zoned R6 on our comprehensive plan. And 20 years ago, I think I raised that as an issue that really R6, which was an old remnant of King County zoning, was not appropriate for that property. Uh, it still is not a, a appropriate. It's probably less appropriate than it was 20 years ago. So you'll find that as you do the land use plan, some of the opportunities or the lack thereof of being able to apply for the full package of infrastructure extensions is gonna become clear 
and is going to help shape and inform the land use plan as well as the Zach Coos Basin. There are drainage issues in our neighborhood. I hope that we can have uh, the ongoing discussion about public interest in uh, solving those uh, problems in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Herring, followed by Todd Southwick. Karen Herring, 23684 Southeast 32nd Way. I did send a PowerPoint, but I'm not going to click it. I'm just going to read to it. So um, you can click it if you want, and I'd appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Slides one and two. Basin plans cost $200,000 to $400,000, and they are now required. Also, each plan lives for a very long time. For example, King County's East Lake Sammamish Basin Plan final draft from 1994 lives on in our city adopted code. So it's important the information be accurate, plus completely cover the basin being studied, the entire basin. If names, dates, or stormwater references are incorrect, then folks reading the information, like myself, may be misinformed. Please ensure errors are corrected and that key emissions are added. Not all of us are engineers. For slide three, every basin plan should cover and address the following. Flooding or erosion, safety hazards, risks or damage to property or infrastructure, water quality, degradation in groundwater seepage, degradation to the general welfare, excuse me, welfare of the community, and last but not least, identify areas where the infiltrative capacity of outwash soils is exceeded or overwhelmed. Flooding warns that stormwater resources must be repaired or enhanced and soon to avoid safety risks to life and property. Our comp plan says protect people, property, and our environment in the areas of natural hazards, which include landslide area. The Zach Hughes Basin Pan, I'm sorry, the Zach Hughes Basin Plan should rely Oh, should include the Sammamish Trail. King County will hold, will build an ADA walkway by the traffic signal at the intersection. So when more people walk here and bike through this important intersection, flooding must be addressed and safety improved. Gravel carried by stormwater and overflows in perilous, is perilous for bicycle riders, drivers, braking, and pedestrians. Furthermore, water on the roadways sends pollutants to our sensitive Lake Sammamish. You know, that's my worry. Last looking, looking at the cost estimates for our capital improvements, one of the most expensive items is for detention of stormwater. Over the years, the city has kept and used old code and regulations. Um, sorry, I'm running out of time. As one of your stewards, I ask, that along Lewis Thompson, you take every consideration for my neighbors who are suffering from flooding and runoff and <clears throat> please and thank you. Thank you. Todd Southwick, followed by Mary Wichter. You're in a hurry to get me up here and out the door, I'm sure. <laughs> Todd Southwick, 413 209th Avenue Northeast, City of Sammamish. Here, city council, city manager, and city staff. I've lived in my house since 1999 and just before the city of Sammamish Incorporated. I pay taxes and stormwater fees annually as required. Children of families in our area attend public schools. We can call the police, the fire department, and emergency medical services, and they respond. But while we continue to pay increasing surface water fees, plus taxes to the city, we do not receive drainage improvements nor stormwater services. I've emailed previously stating that according to the city streets map, 20% of the roads in our city are private. Thus it seems to make sense 
for 20% of stormwater projects to be funded, allowed, completed in private areas. King County has a neighborhood drainage assistance program for unincorporated areas. King County also identifies and implements capital improvement projects. Senior stormwater manager, Tani Dezel, stated in her email that Kitsap County and King County both have programs to help property owners with private drainage issues. Why doesn't Sammamish? As reflected in City Council member Pam Stewart's email, citizens have pointed out taxes and fees are paid by everyone and stormwater drainage issues should be serviced by the city, especially for older neighborhoods. As you know, the city of Sammamish allocates 200,000 per year in the budget for drainage, neighborhood drainage. In April 8th of 2019, email response from the mayor, she stated funds are not parsed out to public or private uses by percentage. Mayor Christy Malchow also stated that council relies on staff to identify projects. She did indicate that all of the funds, the full 200,000, could be allocated to one area by council instead of smaller projects. I ask that the budgeting of 200,000, possibly increased by 50,000 annually, serve neighborhood drainage problems where, the, where they exist and continue to worsen. It is time to address fairness by providing stormwater services throughout the city. I ask city council to discuss and provide direction with policy in response to complaints by citizens to manage stormwater issues where and when they occur. Council had a recent discussion on stormwater code amendments and the Zaku's Basin plan is on the agenda tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Wichter. Good evening. My name is Mary Wichter and I live at 408 200 8th Avenue Northeast in Sammamish. So we waited for the Zaku Space and Plan to come, and in that time, the Tamarack tight line scored 65 points, as did the Lewis Thompson tight line. Um, and those projects, I feel, should be uh, implemented and deserve first priority. And here's some of the background on Tamarack. Northeast Forest Street is an area where it's 22 to 23 percent slope, and it is in a landslide hazard area. These are pictures of the water running and after it runs, showing you what the erosion looks like. Um, it happens on both sides of Northeast 4th Street, a bit more on the south, but also on the north. And the picture at the bottom, you can see there, the water just really has no place to go because it used to infiltrate in the soils, and then there's just too much runoff. So what the runoff has to do is actually take a 90-degree turn in the ditch and head down there to 210th Avenue Northeast. And you might be saying, hey, why not just send it to the places below? Well, when the water is sent there, we've had landslides on Northeast 4th Street between 209th and 208th Avenues, and the city put a temporary pipe intending that there would be a permanent solution. And also, if uh, you look at the bottom of the pipe, it's really not an appropriate discharge location. That's someone's uh, land area, and that's the playground that we used to have that ended up tilting and had to be removed for safety. Also, if we sent it along the road on 209th, that's been flooding too. The bottom picture there is from 2015, the top picture is from 2017. So there just isn't places to put the water anymore. Um, so what happens is that water that makes that 90 degree turn from Northeast 4th to 210th, it cross based and overflows going south on 210th Avenue and heads to Zacus Creek. And you can see that water doesn't come from the driveways or the houses that comes from um, Northeast 4th Street. And then the bottom picture, you can actually see the erosion that started occurring on the other side of Lewis Thompson Road above Zacus Creek. So fine silt and sediments are transported by gushy, flashing flows and they head to that key salmon stream, whether you believe it or not. These pictures actually just show the amount of sediment that moved between October 22nd and 26th, six days. So there were five emergency surface water ordinances for Inglewood and Tamarack between 2014 and 2016. Our CIP for a tight line was identified in 2012, but they thought a developer would do it, but it still needs to get done. 
Um, there are overflows that do occur because Tamarack floods now all the way to the public right of way. It carries pollutants and silt, it carries metals such as copper and zinc which are very bad for salmon and it impacts safety for all. So this is the top picture is on Lewis Thompson Road where there's uh, kind of curvy roads there, not very safe. And the bottom pictures are night and day at that parkway just above where it goes to the trail to Lake Sammamish. Um, so I did send an email in um, with this. I ask that you look at this. I also would like to say that the Growth Management Hearings Board has put categories of critical areas into two. Those whose functions are valued and protected by the beneficial uses they provide, like wetlands, aquifer recharge, or maybe streams. And the second one is areas where protection is needed due to the threat posed to persons and property, such as frequently flooded and geologic hazard areas. Please protect them. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council this evening? Okay, seeing none, oh. we're done. All right, adjourned. <laughs> okay, um, we have nothing on our consent. So um, we reversed order since um, our um, presenter was um, stuck in traffic. So we are going to item number two, which is the introduction to the draft Zacus Basin Plan. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council. Um, I'll turn this over to Tani and Danica for our presentation. All right, thank you. Um, so good evening, uh, Mayor, Council, citizens. We have a, an extra exhibit here that's not part of the packet. It is um, what Council Member Stewart requested last time, which is a summary of public comments that we re received about the basin plan and our staff response, as well as action that we'll take in um, changing the draft basin plan to the final basin plan. So I apologize this was not in there ahead of time, but got it under the last minute, <laughs> finished it up. All right, so as Tony passes those out, I'll get started with the uh, kind of introducing the topic. So the Zacus Basin Plan introduction that we're sharing with you tonight, uh, we're excited to share with you the work we've done on this plan. You've heard, or in this basin, you've heard from citizens who also are very concerned with this. So without further ado, I will begin. So agenda tonight, we're going to be talking about an overview of what, is this on? There we go. All right, we're gonna be starting with an overview of what basin planning is holistically, diving in specifically about the Zacus Basin Plan, talking about the results we developed as part of this plan, how we're going to implement it, and what the next steps are for us. So starting broad, what is a basin? Uh, it's also known as a watershed, and people usually understand that a lot more instead of basin. So call it a watershed or a basin. So a watershed or a drainage basin is an area of land where water collects on the surface and all drains to a common outlet, such as a river or a lake, in this case to Zacus Creek. And there are multiple basins in Sammamish, about 13 of them, and we're starting a program to uh, look at all of our basins in the city and start a program of you know one basin at a time going through these. On this map, you see the pink lines show the Zacus Basin boundary. It's on the west side of the city on Lake Sammamish. And uh, in the green polygon there, just for reference, is the Tamarack neighborhood. The purple polygon is the Montage neighborhood. And 212th Avenue is on the kind of right side of the sh uh, screen with Lewis Thompson zigzagging down to you until you get to the parkway. A basin plan then, so now that we know what a basin is, a basin plan is a comprehensive document that describes both the natural environment, so our surface water features, as well as built conditions, so our stormwater utility features, because they both really interlock here in the Pacific Northwest and in our city. So we look at both surface and stormwater issues, as well as potential solutions. So we study the problem and propose ways to improve it. Some of those issues could be flooding, erosion, groundwater seepage that is hazardous, water quality concerns, as well as degraded habitat. Things that come out of basin plans, those solutions, are capital projects, uh, maintenance activities, education opportunities, and policy suggestions. Not policies, policy suggestions that council would then adopt. So a history of Sammamish Basin Planning. Um, we have done previous basin plans in you know, 2004, 2011. We have the Inglewood and Thompson 
Basin, so the, the star there is, for, is City Hall for reference. Inglewood uh, Basin is George Davis Creek. Thompson Basin is Ebright Creek. So those have been done in the past, and in 20, 2016, the city adopted a new storm and surface water management comprehensive plan. It identified basin planning as a priority action item. With that in mind, our stormwater staff kicked off this new era of basin planning, starting with Zacus Basin. Um, we're going to be using it as the template for future basins. Uh, we established project priorities as well as a prioritization criteria matrix that we brought to council last year that council adopted. And um, this allows us to prioritize city resources, such as uh, our funding and staff time, to focus on uh, the projects that are most impactful. So Zacus Creek um, is a, uh, what we're doing now. We're finishing that up. 2019, we've just started the Laughing Jacobs Basin Plan you see there. And in the future, we'll be looking at the Pine Lake Creek uh, Basin. So steps to building a plan. This is kind of what we've been doing since 2017 when we kicked off the Zacus Basin Plan. We looked at data review, looked at all sorts of as-built conditions from developments, looked at uh, groundwater uh, levels and monitoring reports, geologic data, uh, tons of data. We did field investigation, got boots on ground, looked at the creek, looked at wetlands, looked at neighborhoods, looked at um, drainage issues that we already know of. We asked the community, we had a couple of open houses, to listen to them to see what those issues were. We identified issues by listening to them as well as looking um, on the ground. And from those issues, we had a workshop where we developed capital projects, uh, potential ones, they haven't been adopted yet, but we developed possible capital projects and strategies that would benefit the basin. So where we are now, uh, not checked off yet is the plan review and approval, as well as implementation of those projects that we've developed. Here's a timeline. So you can see we kicked off this basin plan in November of 2017. We spent most of 2018 really working on this plan, you know, doing our field work, reviewing the data, having those open houses and developing those projects and strategies. And here we are now in uh, July of 2019, um, hoping to get your review and your approval to finalize and adopt this plan. There has been uh, numerous opportunities for public involvement. We've had a couple of residential surveys, public meetings, virtual town halls at uh, key locations. We had a basin plan comment period for three months where we opened, we posted the draft basin plan online and requested comments from citizens. And those comments are included in an appendix of, of the basin plan now. And I've been available the entire time over the last two years or a year and a half to uh, talk to residents, meet them on site, and engage. Just one more slide about community engagement. We've had, like I said, three open houses, those virtual and town halls, the um, draft plan posted online. Overall, I counted about, you know, we talked to about 70 different households, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but this is a really small basin, so maybe only 500 households total. So we're looking at over a 15% you know, engagement rate, which is actually pretty high. So here is a summary of the results, you know, one, a visual uh, distribution of the results. So here are the storm and surface water concerns. Like I said, lots of different squares and triangles and circles, but every point here represents a drainage concern, and this will be summarized on the next slide. But just, just wanted to give you a visual overview of where we're seeing those concerns. There's a lot of citizen reported, you know, water over the road and groundwater concerns in the Tamarack neighborhood, as you can see. Our field investigations in Zacus Creek, we saw a lot of erosion and sedimentation. You can see the circles there. We did some hydraulic modeling, which is indicated by those triangles, and those the modeling results indicated that there was um, those ditches and culverts are undersized at some of those locations, and we predicted um, overtopping of the banks of those ditches at those triangle locations. So again, I'm going to describe this again in the next slide. A summary with pictures. So like I said, there are those stream issues that we noted when we were on the ground looking at the stream. We saw channel incision and sedimentation in areas, which indicates a lot of peak flows, flashy flows that are scouring away the stream. You can see on the top left there. There are other surface water issues on the right side. Uh, Tamarack has a very difficult conveyance issue that they've been struggling with for years. 
um, not just Tamarack, but other infrastructure in the basin is aging, and we looked at that to assess its age and condition. And as I said, there were modeled flooding and surcharges um, on Lewis Thompson Road at those culvert crossings. Danny, were, I can, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no. If you're, no, can you finish on this slide? Okay, sure thing. So other, the two other issues that we saw, just to, you know, wrap it up here. Uh, erosion and slope stability issues, we did see indications of landslides within Zacus Creek. Uh, that could be from groundwater seepage causing instability at the toe of the slope and then the slope sloughing down. And then we are concerned about you know, habitat and aquatic health. Uh, there are fish passage barriers. Uh, there's one less now that the Zacus Creek Fish Passage Project is complete, but there's another barrier at 206th Avenue. There's invasive vegetation and we have water quality concerns. So there. I did have a question, but it's actually on the previous slide. Oh, yes. Um, so the the modeling results, um, you said, were for ditch and culverts that are undersized, but I only note one that's up off of Lewis Thompson. So are modeling, did you actually go and, I'm assuming, observed the ditches and culverts all up and down, even on the private infrastructure? We did. Okay. We, our field and, work and did take So they're all fine up there, because we had had comment up here last week that they're, they were not serving their purpose, so they're right. okay? It's, so the modeling did not go all the way up there. Okay. We mostly did the modeling on the main Lewis Thompson Road. Okay. And there we, we did note a specific concern on 210th place, which is where that triangle mm -hmm. is, and that is where we did visually see um, the water overtopping that location where there's the wall failure. Um, so we already have done projects to alleviate those two or three triangles. Okay. But we did not model all the way up there. We only had you know, this much budget and gotcha. making that large of a model costs quite a bit of money. Okay. Okay, so from that compendium of drainage issues and concerns, we developed potential projects, both capital in the Red Stars and non-capital. This looks like a very patriotic slide. We just did, our, we tried to do our due diligence in uh, generating projects. And you, you will note that there is kind of a lack of stars on the Tamarack neighborhood. I will discuss that in a later slide. Um, so like I said, we developed these capital, conceptual capital projects, um, and I'll discuss those. And the non-capital being habitat, water quality, maybe policy suggestions, uh, right now. Sorry, next slide. And before I jump into that, uh, bef the, sorry, uh, for the project and plan implementation. So this, I brought this slide in to remind council of the uh, resolution that was adopted last summer about stormwater prioritization criteria, which is we know there's issues. We have a bunch of, we have a list of potential projects in the city. How do we compare them and make it apples to apples? This was our solution and that's the stormwater capital um, prioritization criteria where we can rank these basins projects against projects in other basins. So every project can score a maximum of 100 points. The environmental benefit a project can score up to 30 points there. Uh, 25 points if it is a facility or maintenance improvement. Uh, safety, it can score, a project can score up to 25 points. Population benefited, there's a possibility of 10 points there, so the more people that are benefited, the higher the score. And then if there's an opportunity to partner with other projects, we consider that a time sensitive opportunity and a project could score more points. So with that in mind, now I'll show you the, the ranked capital projects. The score is uh, circled in yellow there. You'll note that those are not in order of number because some project scopes changed and we had to move things around. But the score is out of 100 points. Of these 10 capital projects, we developed conceptual design, so kind of a 10% cost estimate and schematic and scope of work for the top four. Again, that was budget driven. Um, and just you know, we wanted to allocate those resources to the most critical projects. So the top four projects, there is a possible retrofit of the West Montage Vault to provide more flow control and water quality. We have a project on um, Zaku's CIP-2 to reduce sheet flow on Lewis Thompson at 210th. There's the Lewis Thompson Road tight line, which I'll dive into more in another couple slides. Uh, that, that ranked the highest actually, so 65 points. And then uh, Zaku's CIP-4, which is intercepting that groundwater uh, in the ditch adjacent to the parkway. And that's one that you've seen pictures already tonight where there's sheet flow across the road. That project would capture that water on the east side of the parkway before it crossed the road and provide 
provide the water quality treatment there and reduce that safety hazard. There are also non-capital projects. So these are the blue stars on you know, two or three slides ago. So there's habitat projects where we would improve the habitat, you know, do more plantings or do some in-stream work. There's operational, that's denoted by the traffic cone, where we would do um, kind of more maintenance activities, less capital, more taking care of our infrastructure. There's pos uh, policy suggestions, such as uh, looking at property acquisition. There are water quality improvements, uh, so there's removing trash and debris in the creek, implementing recommendations for water quality monitoring, which we've actually already begun doing, and then uh, some other projects as well. So I wanted to give you a closer look on ZACU's CIP3. This is the Lewis Thompson Road tight line, and this is just kind of to show you what our thought process was when we developed all of these, these projects. So with each project we discussed you know, what the scope of work would be, those benefits, uh, challenges, and we gave it a score as well as a cost breakdown. For this particular project, this would include tightlining Lewis Thompson Road, and there's multiple schedules, different options for implementation. And just note, adoption of this plan does not mean you're approving this project. This is just a, um, just a peek into it. Um, so this project, though, would it would give a formal drainage system to Lewis Thompson Road, which is just ditches right now, ditches and culverts. It reduces erosion in numerous outfalls to the creek, improves water quality because it would, it would include a water quality facility. There would be retrofit of an existing infiltration facility or adding more flow control. And there's an option to include non-motorized improvements with this project, so adding sidewalks, bike lines, uh, bike lanes, better guardrails, et cetera. Um, Challenges here, just we said flow control siting, but it would be part of this project, absolutely. Uh, you see the project prioritization score there. Right now it's at 65 points with asterisk by safety because this does address the safety concern of sheet flow across Lewis Thompson Road coming from 210th. But if you were to add motorized improvement or non-motorized improvements to this project, that score would go up, the safety score. So this project would, would increase in score. Yeah, so I'm just curious. Um, you know, we just did a big project over there, and was this not part of it because this plan wasn't complete yet? I mean, there was extensive work done on the wall over there on Thompson Hill, and we had to repave the road, and it just seems like it, in terms of the time sensitivity opportunity, right, that, I mean, maybe we missed it, but was it because we hadn't approved this plan yet? Co correct, we actually uh. had not even developed this as a potential project at all. I see, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And one thing I did want to note on here is that last meeting when we talked about the private versus public infrastructure, we talked about a potential stub out from this project. We recommend not including that in this plan because we're still discussing it and um, as I'll show in, in the next couple of slides, there's obviously multiple options for council to consider with that issue. All right, so here's the what about Tamarack slide because there was, you know, there were a lot of dots, a lot of concerns in this area, but there is no uh, ranked project in this area in this basin plan. So as you know, there are a lot of unique issues if the city were to do a project here. You know, there's that easement discussion, there's what is the public versus private benefit, financing questions, and the question about precedent setting. All of these will be discussed at a future meeting when we come back to you. Um, so it's, it's you know, it's tied very closely to the Zaku Space and Plan, but I think it should be a separate issue because it's so complex. We did develop two projects initially with this Space and Plan conceptual projects to address stormwater. They are in Appendix D, but they are not ranked. Um, our council, your council direction from last meeting was that we will come back in the fall to present options uh, pending our workload. As you know, we're, we're losing our program manager. So pending workload, we're coming back you know, as soon as we can to present these to you these possible options. But again, we believe adoption of the plan as is gives council the flexibility to direct staff with, you know, and consider these complex issues without locking staff or council into one particular course of action in a basin plan. Today I got to spend the day down at, uh, down on Mercer Island for the King County Flood District. And I noticed that there was, um, on the budget for this year, there was a lot of new projects, road projects. 
um, in particular for the very reasons of which we're speaking. So um, I just want you guys to keep that in mind when we're talking about adding a stub or something to help for the Tamarack area, um, that those are a lot of projects that are coming in from King County that are falling under the King Co County Flood uh, District step for funding. So um, I, would, I would love to see that looked at. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we're already applying for grants like that for other projects such as George Davis uh, Creek Fish Passage Project, a Zach Hoos Creek Project, qualified for those grants. So as soon as we get an approved project on an adopted six-year CIP list, it qualifies for grants and we would pursue grants for any project, large capital project we do. Absolutely. So the next steps for the basin plan is, is really the implementation and adoption, or adoption then implementation. Um, so a reminder that basin projects would be ranked against citywide projects. Staff suggestions for which projects should be included will be reflected in the 21-22 budget and reflected in our 21 to 27 six-year stormwater CIP plan, which guides our work plan and staffing and budget resources. So our next steps, um, collecting and including council input to the basin plan, I've already collected uh, citizen input and there are some adjustment or additions that we're going to be making. So I'd like to hear any input council has and then bring this plan back to you to adopt by resolution in the near future. Okay. Council Member Stewart. Yeah, I think um, adding on to what uh, Deputy Mayor Moran was talking about, uh, when I think about this potential tight line project, um, and the fact that it ends down at the, the bottom of the hill there and that King County is gonna be doing work down there. Again, it seems like we need to be really smart and opportunistic and coordinating our efforts uh, to build whatever facility, even if we can't build the entire tight line project, that the work that's gonna be done at the bottom of the hill, we should try to plan to do that at the time that they're working on the, the trail down there. Um, are there plans, or is anybody looking at what King County's plans are down there and how we can make sure that if we're tearing something like that up and we're building infrastructure that we're doing it all at one time? Right, good point. Uh, yes, we've looked at the King County trail plans. They are not looking to upsize the existing culverts that are down right now at the intersection of Lewis Thompson and the Parkway. However, the project that we would do as part of that Lewis Thompson tight line would be installing flow control where there really is none right now. So that's why we are seeing flooding. So a flow control facility would detain that water and then attenuate it or let it off at you know slower rates to match a two year flood. And that is a very, you know, a relatively small amount of water. So it would, the conveyance that is in place now would be able to uh, have that capacity for any conveyance it needs for our facility. But is, is there any work that would be done in that same location that should be done at the time that King County's doing that construction? We would be looking at something, a property that's completely within city of Sammamish limits. And I believe they, King County is looking at construction in the summer of 20. We cannot, I don't think we can possibly design and start construction anytime in that timeline. Okay, thanks. I don't see any more lights on, but I will say that I really appreciate the fact that um, you were able to come and present the basin plan because I know originally it was on consent. And I think um, by the look of our audience, there are several people in the community that are keenly interested in the basin plan. So um, as we go forward, I would recommend bringing basin plans before council. It's, it's really nice to see all the projects. And I mean, frankly, it gives you guys the opportunity to shine too because you get to show us all the work that you did rather than just tacking it on consent. So thank you for all of your work on it. Um, it's, um, it's nice to see it kindly come together. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So no more comments or questions on our end unless you need something else from council. I guess just, just to head nod to make the, there's one or two changes that's on this list that we can add to the basin plan and then I'll plan to bring it back uh, for adoption via resolution in the fall. Okay. I have one more comment that just popped up, Deputy Mayor Moran. And this is just, this is probably just me, but I'm having a really difficult time trying to separate the issues that are happening in Tamarack from the Zacuz Basin. I'm just, I, I, to, to do, to me, to okay, part of it is only doing half of the job. Um, so I'm having really a tough time with that part of it. So um, I, I, I'm having a hard time separating the two. 
I think it's a, a package deal. So just, oh. I'll just add that we have included projects on private property in, in the basin plan in Appendix D. And if the basin plan is approved and the city council proceeds with direction to staff to do projects on private property to partner with the local residents, those projects are already in the plan, ready to be more fleshed out. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council. Um, staff did a great job, and I, I'm very happy that we brought this before Council. Um, before she or before they bring it back in the fall, uh, if you have any other comments, something comes to your mind, something happens, please get it to staff as soon as possible. We can look to make some changes if needed, and then as we bring it back for final approval, we'll have everybody's idea and make sure we get everything that, that we need to in it. So like I said, if you have something, please don't hesitate and let us know. So thank you. Thank you, staff. Stuart? Sorry, one more question. Um, I noticed uh, when I was reading through it that the, the project um, for montage, the montage project also had um, items listed in it around private property. And so I was wondering if you could talk about how that is different than what's going on in Tamarack and not to, not to derail that project, but to just understand why there's, there's work that's gonna be done on private property in, in Montage and that's okay, but to do work on private property in Tamarack is somehow not okay. And I'm trying to understand the difference. No, council member, you're absolutely right. We, we would never do work on private property unless you know, there's the, the public benefit and it's approved by council. Um, but we would need an easement or we would need to purchase property. So the particular project in Montage, Zach CIP1, it involves property acquisition, installation, so then it would become a city, you know, a publicly owned mm -hmm. parcel. And then all work that we would do as part of that, prop uh, that project would be on public property. And is there not an option to do that same thing in Tamarack to purchase the property and then it would be a public benefit? I mean, I I'm just trying to follow the same logic and understand why we would take one approach in one neighborhood but not the same approach in a different neighborhood. You're absolutely right. It would, and this is kind of getting into that other discussion, you know, linked but separate uh, from Zachary's Basin Plan, but that is um, that we would have to then own the streets. That's what you're talking about is property acquisition would be owning the streets of Tamarack. So how's it different? I, I'm sorry, and maybe this is just a rudimentary question. But, sorry, um, <laughs> there are voices. Um, I'm hearing voices. Uh, if we if we have to acquire property in Montage, we already own the streets in Montage. So if we're acquiring property, we're acquiring something other than the streets. Correct. Correct. So I'm confused again in Tamarack. How acquiring property, whether it's a street or not a street, is any different? I think the main difference is the origin of the problem. The problems in Tamarack are, are originate on private property to solve private property issues. The project in Montage is to solve uh, a very obvious public property issue of drainage on public streets. And the, the, the water originates on the streets? It doesn't originate on property? It's on the streets, it's from the streets. Catch basins on the streets. Okay. It would be interesting to, to really clearly understand that. To, if there's more information that you could share or point me to where that is so that I could understand the difference more, I would really like to kind of dive in on that. I, I can flush that out definitely the next time we come back to council. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I think we're good. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thanks. Do we have council members on? Okay, so, all right, we'll let you go ahead and while we're shifting gears here. Do, uh, Melanie, will it take you, how long will it take you? It seems really early to take a Okay, so our next agenda item is, is back to item one, which is a King County 2019 Comprehensive Solid Waste Plan. And let's make sure we've got council members on the line here. Uh, Tom is back on now. Okay. Tom's on, or did he just fall off? Should, nope, he's there. No, I'm still on. Do you want me to con try to contact uh, Romero? Did he, did he, 
did he contact you and say he was done with his meetings yet or not? Oh, I think he's off to go contact him. But he may have put you on. No, he never, he never contacted okay, me. Okay, I would wait because I think that was Melanie's instruction. When he's done with the meetings he's at, he was going to text you and let you know to call him. All right, I'm okay. happy to do that. So we're a, we're a go then. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Go if we're ready. Um, good evening, Mayor, fellow council members. I'm uh, Andrew Zager, city engineer, here with Pat McLaughlin of the uh, King County Solid Waste Division. Uh, here to do a brief presentation on the 2019 King, uh, Comprehensive Solid Waste uh, Management Plan by King County. Uh, it was recently, I believe, adopted by the county council and is now going, making its ways through the local jurisdictions, local cities for approval and support. Uh, once it's, it meet, meets the uh, population requirements, it'll then move to the Department of Ecology for ultimate approval. Um, we are here to do a presentation and answer any questions that the council may have. Uh, after that, I'll just ask for s some direction on if the council wants to proceed with a resolution and support, which then we will bring back in next meeting uh, next week for uh, consent for approval. And with that, I'd like to just uh, introduce Pat McLaughlin here with the Solid Waste Division, and he can proceed. Uh, good evening, and thank you again for the record. My name is Pat McLaughlin, and it's my uh, honor to serve as King County's Solid Waste Director. I want to begin with apologies for uh, not calculating my traffic uh, time accurately and, and my uh, appreciation for your flexibility on your schedule to still accommodate me this evening. Uh, it is uh, an honor to be before you and talking about a plan that has been in the works for many years now. Um, our regional system uh, is guided by this uh, comprehensive plan. And when I talk about a regional system, it, it truly is a broad regional system. It serves uh, most of King County, uh, certainly all of it uh, uh, over 2,000 square miles, 37 of its 39 cities. So all cities except for the city of Seattle that does have its own solid waste system. And the city of Milton, which is part of the Pierce County system. But the remaining 37 cities, all the unincorporated uh, parts of the county, uh, serving over a million and a half folks, and geez, almost a million tons of garbage, uh, represents this regional solid waste system. And this policy and planning document, which we call the comprehensive plan, is a really critical uh, point of guidance for the region uh, as we uh, provide our uh, waste prevention, recycling, resource recovery, and waste disposal strategies. And yet, uh, this plan has not been updated since 2001. And we find ourselves at some critical intersections, particularly in the areas of uh, waste uh, uh, disposal, and a lack really current guidance and policy framework, and uh, I think uh, we can all agree a lot has changed since 2001. So we've been working across the region uh, to uh, update this plan. I want to point out that one of the uh, strongest aspects of our regional system is the fact that it's a blend of both public and private partnerships. So uh, just as we have partnerships with, with each of the 37 cities, uh, cities, in turn, have uh, uh, relationships with private haulers. Uh, we, too, have uh, a reliance on the private haulers who have made uh, investments in infrastructure uh, over the years, not just for collection, but for material uh, processing and our recycling programs. And we also have a pretty substantial partnership at the landfill with a private entity that helps us uh, produce energy. Uh, from the waste at the landfill. We'll talk a little bit about that this evening as well. So it's, uh, it's a very integrated system uh, that uh, has been serving 
the uh, businesses and, and residents of King County for, for many decades. But as I said, we've got some big decisions to make. And tonight, uh, although the comprehensive plan has a much broader focus, there's three areas that I think would be of greatest interest to your community uh, and to the decisions before you this evening. <clears throat> so we'll focus uh, on waste disposal, on the transfer services, and then recycling. And I actually like to begin with recycling. It's really one of the most important uh, uh, things we can do in terms of not burying waste, not having to worry about um, how to dispose of it, because there's great opportunities to not create the waste to begin with. Now, I have to uh, begin by acknowledging that the region as a whole has a tremendous track record of recycling. I mean, we definitely live in a community across King County that has a value uh, for recovering resources and diverting them back into the economy, and, and that's a wonderful thing. I also have to point out that, so we have a 54% recycling rate, which is tremendous. It's almost twice that of the national average. We know how to get that to 70%. We can do much better. And we can do much better by looking at uh, communities such as Sammamish. Sammamish for your single family recycling rates, just as an example, are over 60%, about 61%. That is phenomenal, right? So what just your own community has demonstrated uh, a passion and commitment to can teach uh, much of the other parts of King County and unincorporated areas as well of how to raise the bar. So in this comprehensive plan that's before your city for consideration is a menu of options, some of them uh, already adopted perhaps by your city, others that, that haven't been, that can raise the bar for all of King County. But we have left the individual opportunity of each city to be able to choose from that menu of options. That's good news and bad news. It, it gives cities really what they've asked for. They, they like that uh, ability to uh, develop their recycling programs uh, and customize them, if you will, for their own community. And I can understand and relate to that. And we have done similar approaches even for unincorporated areas. But there's some bad news associated with that for all of us. We have effectively with 37 cities and the unincorporated areas, we have 38 different ways to recycle in King County, right? So depending on where you live, work, and play, recycling's different. And that breeds a lot of confusion. That confusion breeds a lot of contamination. And that contamination devalues the recyclables. And it even can, that confusion can prevent people from even trying, they'll just throw it in the garbage. Today, this is a busy part of our season, we had probably close to 140 truckloads taken up to Cedar Hills Regional Landfill. I would estimate that about 120 of those trucks were actually filled with recyclables. So there's a huge opportunity to do better. And again, this plan identifies a menu of options. One of the actions is actually undertaken by the county where we've committed to work not just with the city of Sammamish, but with the 36 other cities and with our own county council to harmonize the way that we recycle. To not have 38 different ways to recycle, but to have one way to recycle. And that will take some concession and some challenges, but if we do that, uh, and we also take some of the other approaches laid out in this plan, uh, we can easily achieve a 70% recycling rate. And when we begin to talk about disposal, and I can share with you that um, we've identified the least expensive disposal option. After Cedar Hills closes, whenever that happens, any other disposal option is gonna be more expensive. That's just a fact. So the least we can put through that next disposal option, the better. So really, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to invest more effort and harmonize our approaches uh, in minimizing the amount of uh, waste we have to recycle and get it, getting it back into the economy. So before you move to the next slide, I, it, it would, I feel like there's an opportunity here to pump the message of um, empty, clean, and dry. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. They put their recyclables out, the cardboard's hanging out the top, it gets rained on, and you may have just contaminated everything in your entire recycle bin by doing that. And so empty, clean, and dry. 
Mayor, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a simple message. <laughs> and, and if you do that, I will even go on to say, and you still put it in the wrong can. Let's say you put something that was empty, clean, and dry, and you put it in a recyclable can, at least it's not going to contaminate yes. what does belong in there. So that's a great message. Thank you for bringing that up. A couple more lights that just popped on here. Councilmember Stewart. Yeah, um, so you talk about uh, trying to reduce the variety of ways to recycle. I would imagine that in addition to reducing costs because we can make Cedar Hills last longer, I would imagine it would also just reduce the cost of recycling overall. Is that true? If the recyclables are cleaner, they have a higher value, and that reduces the cost uh, associated with their collection and processing. Okay, so I think that's another sort of data points that as we move forward with this, it's great for us to have that kind of data to be able to communicate out to the community to help people know that it's, it's not just that we can increase the recyclables, but we can we can reduce the cost, we can save money uh, two ways, right? By reducing or increasing their value, so we reduce the cost of collection and making Cedar Hills last longer, which I think is probably where the real cost savings is gonna come in, I would imagine. Well, I think we're at a very pivotal, a pivotal point uh, in our recycling journey. Uh, and, and I think some of the challenges that we're gonna have is that we have a tradition, you can even look at this screen, There's we're recycling all kinds of things because we technically can recycle them. Really recycling in part is defined by a market demand for that material. And you know, the, as you've learned uh, through uh, international events such as China's import policies, um, markets change and there isn't demand for all materials. And so we also have to be aware and, and maybe we'll find ourselves not recycling items that we used to. We should focus on the quality of the recycle stream uh, versus the quantity. So we used to have a message in general of reduce, reuse, and recycle, right? Recycling being the last item on the list. So. Are we still pushing the message of reduce the waste? I mean, the first and foremost should be reducing your waste and then reuse things as much as you can and recycling is the third best option, not, not the first option. Or is there, are there still programs and, and materials out there to help educate people on how to do those things Ab as well? Absolutely, and again, I just, it's so, it's so uh, exciting to hear uh, uh, the council and the mayor talking uh, so uh, eloquently and, and uh, on track with these points. We, uh, we have to, and we do continue to focus on waste prevention as a, as a first step. Food waste uh, is a huge component, right? In fact, uh, I like to say when, we, when we're analyzing, and we do, we, we do waste characterization studies, what's going into the landfill, the biggest piece of the pie is the pie itself, it's food waste. Um, it's estimated that uh, one out of four grocery bags just goes to the landfill, right? There's a lot of food waste. And so we have a, a variety of education and outreach programs, food too good to waste uh, campaigns. We work uh, with schools. We have a green schools and an earth heroes program, including uh, uh, schools here in your own uh, fine city who have been awarded for their uh, uh, progress in, in reducing waste. Um, and, and a lot of it is just having those conversations. So it's a waste prevention. You, we couldn't spend enough effort in that uh, part of the equation. Deputy Mayor Moran. Do you still have the, like the composting classes and stuff like that for the food waste as well? Um, you know, I, I'm not certain. Uh, I think you're referring to the master composter Right. Uh, certification programs, and I, I'm not. I, I'll get some information about the the status of that program. I'm not certain. Councilmember, when uh, we'll have a an update of kind of our status of our solid waste reporting, and we can provi we can provide some of those programs and what their availability at that time. Councilmember Ross. Yeah, I just want to circle back on the mayor's comment about clean, rinse, and dry, there's two lost opportunities. One is simply not placing recyclables in the recycle bins, and the other is not properly preparing it, cleaning, rinsing, and drying it. 
How big is that clean, rinse, and dry, or the preparation on recycles? Is that a huge lost opportunity? Or is, and it's so it should yeah. we really enhance education. And, and I've, I've heard a lot about it recently, quite frankly. So I think the answer is yes, we're enhancing education, but. Yes, it, it's, the, it's the message. Uh, that's why I appreciated the mayor bringing that up. It's, if there's only one takeaway, are you all listening? All right? It's empty, clean, and dry. And I know, I, I'm, I'm getting the, the wave over there, right? It's, it's empty, clean, and dry. That's the, because what's happened and is that whether it's the cardboard or the, or the yogurt or, or, or anything else, that drips out and stains, and you put that wet material in a container on the seas for several weeks. You open up that container, you've got you've got all kinds of bacteria and mold and stench, and you know there's no market for that kind of material now. So it is definitely empty, clean, and dry. <clears throat> Great dialogue. And that's just about recycling, <laughs> all right? That's good to get warmed up. Uh, one, of the, one of the other core responsibilities we have uh, in the equation, we being the county, is we handle the transfer of the waste. So while you are contracting with private haulers to collect the waste curbside, um, in our interlocal agreements, and we have an interlocal agreement with you till the uh, year 2040, and thank you for that. We've been a long partner, and it's great to know that we've got a, a long future ahead of us. Um, you, you agree to direct all that waste to us to be handled. So the recyclables go into the open market space, but the uh, garbage comes to us. And so we have these transfer facilities, uh, eight throughout uh, the county, plus a couple of drop boxes. And they serve two purposes, and, but their primary purpose is to be a uh, convenient drop location for your haulers so they can unload and get back into the neighborhood and continue to serve the community. So we have uh, facilities uh, across the urban area and for several years we've been modernizing those facilities because they were all built back in the 60s and some of them can barely fit a modern sized garbage truck. Some of them have no recycling at all to be offered. The picture you see here is uh, of our newest station uh, built uh, just down the road in, in the city of Bellevue. It's called our Factoria Recycling and Transfer Station. Uh, it is, uh, I guess, uh, you know, a, a typical what we call a modern station. It's fully enclosed. Uh, its predecessor, which was open until this uh, 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 was ready, was an open air station. It was like a carport. And it, you can imagine very difficult to control noise, odor, and dust. It had no recycling uh, services at all. Uh, now this modern facility looks more like an office building, has a full suite of recycling, can uh, provide a quicker service. Uh, customers can get in and out much faster. Uh, it offers much more sustainable uh, design in terms of the materials that are used and how we operate the station itself. Uh, and it's providing more equitable, equitable service levels. And that's what we need to do in all parts of the county. Uh, so right now in the Northeast, we have a remaining station. It's the last one, <clears throat> excuse me, the last one slated for modernization. It's called our Houghton Station. It's uh, hosted by the city of Kirkland, also built in the mid 60s, uh, also an open air station with minimal uh, ability to control that noise, dust and odor. Has a tremendous amount of volume leaving the station because we can't compact the waste. When we compact the waste, as we do at Factoria, and most of the other stations now, we cut the outbound truck traffic by one third, very substantial benefit. What's interesting is the uh, residents and businesses who use the station in, in Houghton, they're paying the same tipping fee that those use Factoria, and yet they're getting so much less. So it's really about addressing uh, an inequity uh, in our transfer service. So the a uh, key transfer action within this comprehensive plan is to begin siting and building a new Northeast station. And this would finish the modernization project underway <clears throat> and uh, aid in our uh, recycling uh, goals as well because a tremendous amount of recycling actually happens at the stations. <clears throat> uh, 
The uh, third area I'd like to cover with you tonight, and this is quite honestly perhaps the most time critical uh, decision that uh, needs to be made, is where is the garbage going to go? Uh, this last week, we received uh, certification and permits to begin using our newest cell. We call these cells uh, by area number, and we're at area eight. So it's the eighth cell uh, at, at the Cedar Hills. Um, this is the only cell that is fully authorized um, to receive waste. And we've begun placing waste in it this week, and by about 2025, it will be full. Um, we have to have a place for the garbage to go in less than 10 years. Now we can go back over a couple of the areas uh, in area what we call area five and area six and do some top lifts, but we are reaching the built capacity of the Cedar Hills landfill. It's been in operation since 1965. It's allowed us uh, to manage our waste locally at the lowest cost and with the least environmental impact. So it's been a great asset and there is remaining capacity. Uh, it's a little difficult to see perhaps in the uh, image on the screen, but in the upper right segment of the uh, 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 aerial that you're looking at, you'll see some buildings. And those buildings are sitting on prime real estate because those uh, buildings are in uh, areas that could be permitted for landfilling. And so the plan has identified uh, those buildings to be relocated elsewhere on the site and a final cell uh, to be uh, built uh, on Cedar Hills. That capacity would take and provide the region uh, disposal through about 2040. Um, and, and then we would have reached our, our true maximum capacity within our established footprint uh, at Cedar Hills. Before reaching this uh, determination, we looked at options and there are primarily two other options to consider. One is waste export, and that's certainly been the approach of the uh, city of Seattle and the uh, Snohomish County uh, for many years and uh, is available to us as well. There are some risks and concerns with waste export. Um, one is rail capacity. There are segments of the rail already at capacity. So while we can estimate the costs and the costs are greater than local landfilling, uh, we're not sure that those costs actually reflect the total cost to address some of the capacity constraints that the railway will ultimately have to uh, integrate. There's also some environmental implications associated with waste export uh, in that we have to transport this waste uh, hundreds of miles in order to have it disposed at an out of county landfill. <clears throat> so not as adv advantageous to being able to manage waste locally. Another option that we looked at was waste to energy. Quite honestly, we don't know as much about waste to energy uh, as we do say waste export because of the local uh, experience or, or local landfilling, which we've been doing for over 50 years. So we had to hire experts to help us better understand what the options and availability and impacts would be for waste to energy. And we were fortunate to do just that. We, we were uh, able to secure uh, uh, Norman Dow and Associates who uh, built a team of renowned experts who've been involved in the most recent uh, waste to energy projects here in the U.S. They also looked at international uh, projects as well because there's a lot to be learned from there. And what we found is that waste to energy is a viable option for this region to consider. It does work. It's not really a question of technology. Um, there are uh, financial and environmental uh, implications that would need to be managed. And, and in a side-by-side -side comparison, um, you know, they don't really compare to local landfilling. But I think what we've discovered is that we have to take a hard look at what's next. The Cedar Hills uh, certainly can serve this region for a little bit longer, but it is reaching its, its finite capacity. Uh, and work to determine what follows needs to uh, continue. So even as this comprehensive plan uh, is hopefully adopted by the region, our planning can't end. If we want to pursue waste energy, as an example, we're going to need the time to pull that off. And if we don't continue the planning exercise, 
then that will be removed as an option just because we ran out of time. Uh, the complexities associated with it uh, are substantial, but that's not a reason not to pursue it. Uh, so what this plan calls for is maximize the remaining capacity with the asset that we have. That's the lowest rate impact available to uh, our rate payers, the lowest uh, environmental impact associated with, with greenhouse gases, but it also builds us a runway to keep all options on the table, whether it's waste export or waste to energy or any other emerging technology that avails itself to the region uh, going forward. So I'll pause there in the event you have some questions that you'd like me to address. Councilmember Russ. <clears throat> yeah, you mentioned that Cedar Hills will max out in 2040. Do you know what recycling percentage is assumed in that? I do think that's a great question, right? Because, um, boy, if we're, if we're at 70%, uh, we're at 54 now and we get it up to 70%, that, that's a tr tr you know, tremendous uh, reduction of waste going into the landfill. But we didn't assume that. What we assumed is a very modest increase to 57% between now and that period of time. So we're counting on continued improvement. However, we don't have the regional commitment yet to that 70% plan. And so we did not assume that in our capacity planning. Councilmember Stewart. Yeah, uh, so adding on to that, um, how do we get uh, here in Sammamish, how do we get from 61 to 70%? I mean, it's great that we're above the 54%, but we're, we're not at 70. So do we have concrete actions that you can give us or ideas that we can go and build steps so that we can get to that 70%? I mean, we all need to do our part, and certainly if, if we have the capability to do it, let's go, right? Absolutely. Yes, and so in this plan are uh, very clear steps uh, that can be applied here in the city of Sammamish. I mentioned you have a 61% recycling rate for your okay. single family homes. It's you as other regions struggle with multifamily. Your multifamily rates are about 20%. Now that, quite honestly, that's still better than most, right? Um, but uh, so how, you know, and that's affecting your overall rate. What about businesses? Uh, commercial recycling, yeah. harder harder to measure uh, because that is uh, really, uh, you know, privately, uh, w while their waste is directed into our system, uh, we don't uh, have direct measures on their, uh, on their uh, recycling numbers. I had, I had a question on that. Um, uh, one of the things hold I on, hold on, because we got to go in order of lights. Councilmember Stewart, are you? I have a couple more questions, but if, if <coughs> is it okay if she goes if it's related? It, you I'm have the floor, so if you want to yield, if you want to yield the floor yes. to her, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, a few weeks ago, I went to the uh, sustainability summit, summit that was in Kirkland, and one of the things that they came up with for um, for Kirkland is when we were talking about the restaurants in particular, was um, they had talked about all the things that had worked for them and you know, they had tried the plastic bag thing and that didn't really work because they found that people were buying plastic bags in the stores then. Um, but they found the one thing they wish they had done was the uh, styrofoam and, and having going to restaurants and saying, that's it, no more styrofoam. And so that is, I mean, how helpful is that? Because that's something that can easily be done. Yes, I think that uh, bans and mandates are are part of the process, and those are difficult, right? It's it, it, that's a difficult part of trying to change uh, behaviors. But we think that, in part, and if you were going to start somewhere with bans and mandates, we would say, don't put single-use bags and shredded paper in the recycle bin, because when you do, they don't actually get recycled. Uh, the bags get wrapped around equipment. The shredded paper looks like a confetti party. It blows around in the in the sorting facility. It's a mess. It doesn't actually get recycled. So ban those materials from the recycle bin. Now, they are recyclable, right? There are some stores who will take those single-use bags back. That's the best place to put them. There, you can do shred events, and in bulk, that shredded paper will get recycled. So I think that bans and mandates are part of the solution. I think that every other week garbage collection is another approach, and the city of Renton has had great success with that. And that's flipping it uh, on the, you know, flipping it, uh, 
right. between recycling. You do recycling every week. The reality is <clears throat> if we're recycling correctly, that can fills up. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can dump that every week. Right. And you'll find that when you fill it up with recyclables, your garbage is actually a very small can. And you don't need, and the smelly stuff is going away every week, right? You're not hanging on to your food waste uh, or, or your yard waste. Get that going every week and have garbage every other week. It forces a different shift in mentality. So what I'd, I'd love to see um, where you can provide us with sort of those, those list of recommendations. And when I think of the business community, I think of composting more, right? Um, I, I think of, you know, Yes, I go to Starbucks, but they're terrible, right? They don't have recycling and composting, whereas, you know, we have a Ben and Jerry's pop-up and they have compostable spoons and they're working on compostable cups. So, you know, where we can shift to composting, to me, that's the ideal, right? Because that uh, eliminates the... the um, uh, waste in, in Cedar Hills, and, and we don't have to worry about the recyclables being contaminated. But anything we where we can get a list of, of recommendations of things that we can do, whether it be from a policy perspective or an education and communication perspective, you know, things like do the recycle events. I know we talk about styrofoam. We just ordered some furniture, uh, you know, that came, and we had to put it together for my daughter's room, and there's, must, there's like a mountain of styrofoam, which is really annoying. But there's nowhere to take that, right? You have to wait for the next recycling event, which you know may or may not occur in my lifetime. And so, you know, those are the types of things that can we can we figure out what's the ba the right balance of those types of events? Um, I'd love to see us get rid of that styrofoam. There are other ways to package things, but we can't control all of that because those things get shipped into the city. But those are the types of things I think that would be really helpful for us because, in my mind, when I look at the environmental impacts and the cost impacts, the best thing we can do is reduce the amount. Of waste going into Cedar Hills and extend that to 2080, not 2040, right? And then we have plenty of time to figure out what to do next, and we save money and the environment along the way. So um, I think that would be the most helpful thing that, that we can do. I, I think I applaud Kirkland that they're actually doing a sustainability master plan, and I would hope that that's something that we could um, get around to doing here in Sammamish as well, because I think that's what we need to be able to do is to have that um, sustainability in every project that we do, whether it's a, a, a basin plan and we're doing projects there, to road construction, to, you know, getting compost bins all over City Hall so that when we're done with our meeting, we can throw these in the compost and not in the trash. So I think there's lots of things that we can be doing to get that worked into sort of our everyday practices. And if you have that information, that's great. I know I go to the K4C, uh, meetings and we talk about um, other ways to reduce, you know, um, uh, the impacts on the environment as well. So a anything we can do there I think would be really helpful. So, Councilmember Ritchie. Thank you. Um, I've, uh, hey there. I had a, a couple guy really good conversations with Councilmember Lambert about the uh, waste energy idea and my three quick questions that I put down to ask you going into this is, when does that decision need to be made in terms of getting it up and operational? All other things aside, best intentions aside, we do need to have at least a plan B. Yep. And that may be plan A from my perspective, but when does that decision need to be made? And secondary, well, the second question would be, what is the environmental impact of the particulate matter? And I know that's a huge, unknowable question. I'm sure there's a lot. You ask 12 scientists, you get 15 opinions kind of thing. But I, I guess my big question is, has that been analyzed? I, Councilmember Lambert showed me some information from Germany, I believe, where there was some significant research done that was uh, very, very good news in terms of the particulate matter. And then the third question is, what is the energy output potentially? And I know that also bears the idea of what's actually going in. So we don't really know. So as we're trying to diversify our our energy sources as a as a community, is that a viable source of renewable ongoing energy for our community or is it just kind of a byproduct? Thank you. Great questions. Um, so um, I'll start with the, uh, the first one. When, when does this decision need to be made? I think that uh, what what's encapsulated in this plan is the fact that we have to it, we actually say this in the plan that we have to immediately upon adoption of this plan begin planning for the next 
disposal uh, option because we we couldn't if if we wanted to have waste to energy in place by 2025 it just it's just not realistically possible to to site design build uh, finance and have in place it, it's just you know, and so we're out of time. Well, we don't want to be out of time if that's really reflective of what the region wants. So a couple things happen. Uh, we have been asked by our county council and because we've heard from cities such as your own that says, hey, we, we want to know what's next and we wanna have all the options available to us. And uh, so how are we going to get there? The, our county council has uh, provisoed uh, my organization to deliver a plan for how that's going to happen, right? Basically a plan for a plan. This has to be a very collaborative approach because whatever disposal option I choose, now well, first of all, I don't choose it, right? It's the region that chooses it. And so today I was able, at the beginning of this presentation, I was able to describe a regional system as 37 cities in the unincorporated area of King County. If I choose waste export, will 37 cities want to be a part of that system? If we choose waste to energy, will 37 cities want to be a part of that system? There are different implications of that. Maybe 42 cities will want to be a part of one of those systems, right? Maybe this regional system is not what we've traditionally thought of but maybe it's only 12. And these, these cities and the unincorporated areas pay for whatever system we, we elect, right? So um, there are some intertwined decisions. It's, it's what is in the interest of the region and who wants to be a part of that system. We have interlocal agreements with you through 2040 and with this comprehensive plan, I have a basic obligation to provide you with a disposal solution. I can do it with area nine. So the question's going to be, what will Sammamish sign up to for the next ILA period, out to 2080 perhaps? And what will the city of Renton sign up to or the city of Bellevue and the city of Kirkland? We're gonna be asking ourselves that question. What do we want for the next disposal solution that we're willing to be a part of? So that was a long answer. No, I'm with you and I'm looking forward to the other two as well, but I, I yeah. guess my- Thank you. No, Thank no, you. I'm, but it is complicated, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, right? I mean, that's kind of like an answer without an answer, right? So- 2020, I mean, the end of 2021, yeah. I'm gonna deliver a plan to our county council that outlines how that is going to be resolved. Okay. And we should, in the next five to six years, be able to produce yet another long range plan, because these should be updated every five to six years, that our next regional plan should be updated within five to six years and it outlays that answer. So I'm just trying to think about how we get our agenda items here and I would assume King County Council is not hugely dissimilar. Uh, our staff being outstanding as they are, does the deep dives and that's what you're doing, right? You're taking mm -hmm. the deep dives and trying to figure out exactly what makes sense mm -hmm. and not just environmentally what makes sense, but politically what's gonna get passed, mm -hmm. right? And I think the disaster scenario is you come up with the right answer <clears throat> environmentally, but politically it doesn't go anywhere. So when our staff, I take it seriously, when our staff sends a, there's a little recommendation, here's what we think is the right decision for you guys to do, but it's obviously your choice as policymakers. Are you in a position where you're gonna say, here's the recommendation of the professionals as to what steps we should take and kind of, you know, come back and sell the councils or the, is the county council punting this to the cities all the way across? Is that what's going on or? No, abs absolutely not. The, the way this plan was developed was in collaboration with the cities, right? And our stakeholders. Yeah. Uh, we have two advisory committees. Uh, uh, the executive, and I, I represent the executive uh, in this uh, in this process, and ultimately the council uh, uh, through their uh, deliberation. So it, it's a very collaborative process. It, we don't have a plan if there are no cities. We don't have a plan if there's no county. <laughs> right? It it, it ha it's this is a partnership. Okay. Let me address your other two questions. Thank you. Uh, one of them you asked about uh, from an environmental perspective. How how can we or how do we measure and how do these compare 
uh, say waste export, waste energy, or or local landfilling? And the answer is uh, yes, you can measure that, and we did. And in fact, it's it's within the plan. Uh, there's a, a very simple table uh, that summarizes it, and I'll just it's a chap it's six dash six chapter six page six, because that was a really important uh, question. Now. Go to different parts of the world, you might get different ways to measure things. And I'm not talking about metric versus, you know, uh, you know, uh, U.S. standards or whatever. But I'm talking about what do our regulators require? Our, reg our primary regulator is the Environmental Protection Agency, State uh, Department of Ecology, uh, Seattle King County Public Health. So we ask, what do they require? How do they want us to measure uh, environmental aspects? And th there's very prescriptive in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And that's a v that is a key measure, particularly for landfilling, uh, because of the breakdown of garbage and the emission of, of greenhouse gases. And so um, it's estimated that there are about 91,000 metric ton of CO2 equivalents each year associated with the Cedar Hills Regional Landfill. Okay, 91,000. Um, the uh, now this is on a uh, on an annual basis. We there's also a life cycle basis. I'll share with you in a moment. It would be roughly the same at an out of county landfill, but when you then compare that to a waste to energy facility, it's not 91,000. It's 1.2 million, right? So it's exponentially larger. Well, why is that? Because you are incinerating the waste. When you burn anything, there are natural emissions associated with it, and those emissions uh, contain greenhouse gases. Now, there, it's not to say that there's not uh, air scrubbers in the sort in, in place. There are. This can be done safely, but it, in terms of measuring greenhouse gas emissions, and that's what our regulators require us to do, um, 1.2 million uh, metric ton equivalents a year compared to about 91,000. So it's a pretty measurable difference. And quite honestly, so too are the, the costs of, uh, be primarily related to the capital, um, the cost of local landfilling, just for the, just for the landfilling itself, about $41 a ton, um, export about $55 a ton, Waste to energy about $136 a ton, so almost three times that of local landfilling. Now, this isn't just a financial question; it's not just an environmental question. Uh, it is also, uh, you know, uh, a feasibility question and a political question as well. So, there's a lot that the region has to to weigh to come to the right decision. Can I about the? Return our, on our investment potentially. That's a lot of greenhouse gases. It is. Any return for yeah. that? Uh, I, I, CO2? I I neglected to mention the numbers I gave you at one hundred and thirty six dollars a ton include the energy offsets. Oh. That assumes the revenue that uh, is achieved because this is waste to energy, and you could sell that energy. That that it's good news, bad news. Um, energy is relatively cheap out here. Hydropower, uh, as you know, is. Uh, is very efficient. So the cost of energy is relatively low. So when I have energy to sell, the revenue is relatively low compared to say Florida, which is where one of the uh, more recent uh, projects have been successfully ventured, the cost of energy much higher, right? Cost of landfilling, well landfilling is not even really an option in places like Florida, right? It's water tables uh, are so high you can't dig a hole. Uh, so, um, those factors are why waste to energy are, uh, as a solution can be more challenging out here. Uh, waste to, uh, the energy associated with mass burn incineration is not currently recognized by the state of Washington as a renewable energy. Uh, in other states, it is. Well, if it were recognized, so a legislative action could change the equation and help because a renewable energy has a higher revenue potential, right? So there are things that can be done. That's why I say waste energy is not off the table. Uh, it is uh, an option, uh, We and we have to start planning, and I would say in the next five to six years, we need to be able to have the answer 
which includes an understanding of what the regional system would look like with that answer implemented. Thank you. Great questions. Um, let me, uh, just a couple more slides uh, to, to wrap up. One is, I mentioned this has been a, a really a making in two years. We've had uh, our uh, advisory committees uh, and the uh, regional policy committee as well um, provide uh, input throughout this process. In fact, there were amendments made to the plan uh, based on public comment because we've received a lot of public comment, particularly from neighbors around the landfill. Uh, and in response to that, amendments were made to the plan. The, those amendments are reflected in the plan that's before you as well uh, in terms of how we use the buffer, uh, the uh, management of wildlife, particularly birds, um, the use of uh, interim covers, uh, both daily cover, interim and long-term cover to mitigate uh, potential uh, offsite odors, um, really respecting uh, a settlement agreement that we have in place with the local neighborhoods with respect to heights at areas five, six, and seven. Um, a work plan, which I already kind of talked about, what happens after Cedar Hills closes, and that's really the, the work that will commence immediately thereafter. Uh, it's also some interest uh, about how roadway mitigation could be uh, addressed for uh, the roads near and around the landfill itself and a request for increased uh, transparency of reporting relative to some of the regulatory reports that we submit that will now become part of our, our uh, annual report to the county council. So there was some additional enhancements that strengthened the plan uh, through the process. Uh, where we're at now in terms of adoption, uh, now that the Regional Policy Committee uh, has approved the plan, our County Council has approved the plan, it's up to the cities. Uh, and after the cities, the State Department of Ecology will be the final way in. The cities have until uh, September 16th to take action. Uh, that action is typically in the form of a uh, city resolution either in favor or in opposition to the plan. This plan will be adopted based on the action of those cities who uh, so move, uh, either in favor or in opposition, as represented by 75% uh, of the population of those cities taking action. Um, you know, some cities have questioned, well, do we have to take action? You don't, you, you don't have to take action. Um, but I want to point out that if this plan doesn't pass, we'll continue to be guided by our existing plan, which is old. And our existing plan says when Cedar Hills runs out of capacity, you put it on a rail, right? So the default is we will go to waste export. And I don't, this is just a personal opinion. This is not a decision, right? Because we, we could structure this any way we want. But I think once... If, if we ever decide to go to waste export, just like if we ever decide to go to waste energy, I, I don't envision us going a different direction, right? It's difficult to uh, change direction once it's chosen. So I think one thing to consider uh, is the, the risk of non-action uh, if indeed uh, waste export is not of, of interest or aligned with with your city's uh, long-term uh, interest. I, what I like about this plan is it leaves all options on the table and it doesn't foreclose on them. Um, so you have, uh, as a city, until September 16th to uh, take action. Uh, I hope you do take action and I hope you take action in favor of the plan. Um, my hope is that uh, the information I provided tonight will help inform that process. It's really, this process we're in is, is dictated by our interlocal agreements. It calls for a 120 day period. Um, and um, uh, you know, the State Department of Ecology will act uh, when that period closes. So I would be happy to answer any questions that, that remain. And uh, again, wanna thank you for the opportunity to, to dialogue with you tonight. Thank you. Um, I don't have any more lights on, but Council, do we have additional questions? Councilmember Stewart? Yeah, how do we get the, the list of sort of action plans that we can share with our staff so they can review and figure out what might work for <coughs> Sammamish to increase our recycling to 70% for single family homes to set a reasonable target for multifamily? It sounds like 70% might be a little bit too high right out, out of the gate. Um, and you also mentioned that composting is the largest 
percentage of our waste, so it sounds like we should be putting into uh, some sort of a plan to try to reduce compostables in the waste and increase our composting. So if we can get that list um, of, of ideas and see if we can't, as a council, agree to direct staff to, to take a look at that and see what we can do as a city. Yeah, I, page uh, 4.7 in, uh, in the plan is uh, a discussion and actually a very simple illustration of what we refer to as a roadmap to 70%. It identifies the, the uh, individual uh, actions that can be focused, whether it's focused on mandatory food separation, a mandatory separation of wood, cardboard, and metal, mm -hmm. uh, just mandatory separation of recycling at uh, uh, multifamilies. It breaks it out, including the every other week garbage collection. Also gives you an indication of how much percentage gain you should expect with each associated action. So that is uh, in the plan before you, again, on page 4-7. And uh, we'll be happy to uh, sit down further with your staff or, 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 or your council to discuss uh, additional details behind that. But it is, it is within your plan uh, before you. I would, I'd like to ask council if we could uh, agree to direct staff to uh, potentially put together a plan on how to set some reasonable targets and, and create a, a plan to help us move there as a city. So I think um, just as a quick question to the city manager, because um, I'm certainly supportive of the idea, but um, I guess the question is staff workload and ability to take that on. I think as a sidebar or an interim step, maybe um, we have our communications department that could certainly be pumping out information. I think the empty, clean, and dry is a very simple and concise message that mm -hmm. we can get out there, but um, <coughs> I'm certainly supportive of what Councilmember Stewart's saying, but I, I guess, I, I'm just looking to cross check, um, you know, staff's time and availability considering the work plan with whether or not they can produce what sounds like a more robust plan right now, or maybe what their timeline might look like in order to be able to do that. Um, thank you, Mayor Council. Um, sure, we, we can do that. Okay. I mean, it, it, it looks like from what we're talking about tonight, we're going that direction. Obviously, this is something separate from what this presentation is about. Um, but we're happy to do whatever we can to make our city better in all ways. And I think it's a great idea. And uh, we can get more communication out as well on our website and, and through our PIO, uh, through Sharon. And, um, and I, think this is, uh, I think this is definitely the direction we need to go. As the city shows, we're doing our part um, and also uh, um, trying to um, increase, if you will, um, the time for the landfill to maybe stay open a few more years or, or find some options that uh, uh, we, can, we can deal with our waste more efficiently. Uh, I really like this plan and I think uh, it opens up uh, more options going toward the future. Um, so, but definitely we would be willing to do that. So we'll go ahead and work with, with staff and, um, and get that rolling. Great, And uh, we'll add it to our list. Uh, it might not be tomorrow. Of but, course. Uh, Course. But we will work toward that in, in conjunction with what we're doing and what King County is doing as well. Yeah. Um, and, and like I said, I think all agencies should be looking at doing the same thing. So, absolutely. Thank you. Christy, this yes. is Romero. Oh, okay, hold on just a second. Don't give me a Moran. I'll get you next, Romero. No problem. I was just going to say one, especially with summertime coming for staff, I didn't want to, you know, be dumping too much on there. But... Um, I would maybe check with Kirkland, um, give them a call, check their mm. website, whatever it was, because they did. Um, when we had this, they had the sustainability summit, they had some excellent information on all this. Okay. And so that might give you um, a big lead start. There's no sense in reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilmember Valderrama. Yes, following along with both of them, I think that we should be careful not to do this in isolation. I think that it would be behoove us to see if our neighboring cities, I mean, earlier in the presentation, they talked about, well, that's great if you step up, but what does Renton do and the others? We should see about uh, engaging our neighboring cities and see if there's something either through Sound Cities or one of the other uh, programs that we have to work with our neighbors and come up with a solution together. Because if we pick to do the 71% and everybody else is only going to go to 64%, 
uh, I don't think that behooves us. And I think what we have to do is work collaboratively with our neighbors to get the real impact that we're trying to achieve uh, uh, region wide. Deputy Member, do you have more? Are you? No. Okay. Okay. So. Are we squared away on yep, that? Okay, I so. so I think we need to circle back to the plan itself because I think our city manager is looking for potential direction from council tonight as to whether or not to bring forth a resolution. And I assume that would be in September since we're off in August or? We're actually prepared to present the resolution next week. Oh, excellent. Okay, perfect. Bam. All right. <laughs> so do we have any objections from council from that resolution coming forward? I'm not seeing any, so there you go. Okay, thank you thank very you much. Thank you so much, appreciate thank your you. time and thank sorry you. about the traffic. No, again, appreciate the accommodation this evening and congratulations on your success. <laughs> All right, so maybe we should take a five minute break now before we dive into that last subject matter, which is a discussion on the city council committees. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council. Um, we have Mike Sugg with us. Very happy to have Mike here with us. So, no pressure, Mike. But uh, um, <laughs> and Mike's going to do a presentation, quick presentation for you, and uh, um, and I think his presentation includes some options uh, for the council to consider. And um, we'll get right at it. So, Mike, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Mr. City Manager, and good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, as mentioned, we are here to continue the discussion on committees that was uh, first brought up on your meeting last Tuesday. And tonight, staff are looking for Council's direction on whether we need to make any changes to the committee structure. Uh, so in your agenda bill tonight, there are a few potential options. Uh, the first would be to dissolve all committees and remove any mention of the committees from your rules. The second would be to dissolve all committees without amending your rules. And your rules really do not require that you have committees. They basically just say that the committee structure shall be determined, shall be as determined by the city council. And so leaving your rules in place would allow the committees to be reformed in the future uh, if desired by this council or future councils. And uh, the third option would be to dissolve just specific committees if there are issues with any, any one in particular, or just to leave, of course, the committees as they currently are. Uh, the, the full council should have received uh, some additional information about the committees over email last night. Uh, this included details on how often the committees meet, the staff prep time requirements, and count, or committee member attendance. And uh, hopefully that information will help with your discussion tonight. So with that said, if there aren't any questions, I will go ahead and turn it over to the council for discussion. Great. I don't see any lights, um, and I did not see your email, so I was running back real quick. But um, So I think, considering there's no lights, I will um, make a motion and see if we can get out of here quick. I would move that we pull the legislative and the finance committees back to the full council, um, and that would be in the air of both public transparency um, and full council interest in the items that are tethered to those two committees, um, and then as well as decreased staff time for duplication of um, subject matter that we might cover. So I was actually surprised to hear that the Finance Committee is not meeting all that often. And considering that we just passed our transportation improvement plan with an $88 million um, budget uh, deficit, I think the Finance Committee will be of keen interest to everyone on the council. And I think the public is going to be very interested in what suggestions may come out of committee. So I think that would be better to, and I know that the committee meetings are public anyway, but when we're all sitting up here at the dais, I think there's um, it's, it's videoed and the public can then go back and watch. Committee meetings are not videotaped and are not re readily accessible to the public to hear subject matter and minutes are not super detailed. And then as far as the um, legislative committee goes, I think we had great success last, uh, this past legislative session, and I think that's in part due to the fact that we finally have lobbyists um, on our behalf working regularly down in Olympia, and we had a great success with the, um, the de-annexation relative to the parks for the Montaigne and Aldera neighborhoods. So I think we have some momentum behind us, and I think there's um, an interest within the community as well, so on that same vein, and I think the council as a whole is very interested in what we are doing moving forward as well. So so that would be my motion. I'll second. 
Okay, it's been moved and seconded, so now we are discussing the motion on the floor. Council Member Stewart. Sure, I just wanna ask, why are we jumping to let's eliminate council committees? Why aren't we asking, how can we make our council more effective and adjust, and would adjusting how the committees function help with that goal? Are we making a decision here based on what's best for the community and for the staff? Because if I read the memo from Mike Sugg, uh, basically, uh, if I read it correctly, it states that the work done to support the committees is not additional work. It's generally work that has to be done uh, to prepare to submit to council and that it's helpful to get that feedback and bring it on to council. So there isn't really additional staff time that's used there. So are we really doing it for that or are we catering to a council member who hasn't made this work a priority because he isn't available or won't make himself available for committees? Um, I find it interesting that we're targeting the finance and legislative committees. I think the legislative committee is by far the most productive committee that we've had in the 18 months that I've been on the council. Um, it has produced some really great results. Uh, committees aren't intended to just be a place where staff comes and presents things and we rubber stamp it and bring it on to the council. It's supposed to be where we can dive in and, and get some work done and roll up our sleeves. And we are able to have more candid, more uh, just dive in conversational working sessions in committee. They are open to the public, everyone can attend. Certainly all the council members, because we, we notice them, all the council members can attend, so there's nothing hidden. But it's just an opportunity to really have a more productive working session and we can do it during the day. So we aren't asking Mr. Sugg to stay here until 8.30 at night to have a conversation. We can do it during the staff's work day. So, I just think that it, it's very surprising to me that that's where we started with let's eliminate committees. Uh, it is uh, surprising that the finance committee hasn't been meeting and no offense to council member Ross, he's a, he's a good person and I like working with him, but that is part of the reason why uh, I wanted to be the chairperson of the committee so we could get the, the meetings scheduled more regularly and we can also get the, the council reports out because one of the challenges that we've had with all of the committees has been that we haven't uh, been getting the reports back to the council. So what I'd like to see us do is say, hey, how can we make these committees more effective? Council member Ross has great ideas. He was able to provide a lot of insight uh, in the finance committees, ask a lot of questions, ask the staff to be able to do things that the staff might not have the answers for, and that gives them the time to go get the answers so that they're not put on the spot when we're asking them up here on the dais and they don't have an answer. So I think the committees are very helpful and I would hate to lose that ability for council member Ross to be able to, to use his financial expertise and be able to have those conversations in the committees and have those sort of back and forth with staff where it doesn't feel so formal and so much like we're being, you know, people are being watched. So I, I think that that is just a, an interesting proposal. Um, it's interesting that um, the, uh, other committees aren't being proposed to be uh, eliminated. Why just the legislative and finance? Why not then public safety as well? Um, why does that one stay? Uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, either way we go, keep the committees, don't keep the committees, that's fine. I still think that the fundamental question this council needs to be asking is, how is it that in 18 months we've really not gotten anything accomplished? And it isn't because we have committees or don't have committees. I think there are some more fundamental issues. And if, if you wanna try to blame the committees for something, I think that's fine, use it as a scapegoat. I have a list of, of recommendations here that I think we could implement to make the committees more effective. If anybody's interested in actually making us more effective, if this is just a, you know, let's, I don't know. I don't even know where this is coming from. I mean, I, I just, it is, it is beyond the pale that the council member who has abdicated all of his responsibility from the committees is the one that proposes that we eliminate the committees. I just, it's crazy. The, the, the legislative committee is in part uh, very productive because we were able to have these 15 minute uh, every, was it every week or every other week check-ins during the legislative uh, session with the with the lobbyists, things that we can't do. We don't have that kind of agility here on the dais with our scheduled meetings. So I just I just think it's sad that we would eliminate a, a tool that could be that could be sharpened and and made more effective if we decided to work together 
uh, as opposed to we're gonna we're gonna just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I, I think that it's interesting that we're going to try to take uh, you know away anyway. I think if you look at the list of committees and who are on the committees, I think it's pretty obvious what this motion is about. Councilmember Ritchie. Um, I cannot support the motion, but I respect that it's coming from a good place. Um, I uh, serve on the two committees that are up for the chopping block today. Um, I think, at least from my perspective, um, more to the, to the um, motion makers uh, statement about the lobbyists, um, those lobbyists took a lot of, there's a lot of uh, information that went back and forth, and I, I think our management analyst, Mike Seg, will attest to this, that, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but correct me if I'm wrong, that those meetings with the, the, the legislative committee were very informative for those that came. I know uh, Mary was there and Paul Stickney and our, our, some of our folks that came in from the public. And as much as that committee was able to listen and get good information and help bring that information back and uh, our chair, uh, council member uh, Valderam, was able to provide consistent reports. Sometimes the news isn't good. Sometimes there's ideas that come out of there that the council doesn't like. Um, but I, I think that the idea of a, of a, we have a part-time legislature and that legislature is currently out of session, but when they're in session, things move pretty quickly. And those lobbyists that we hired and that we're paying you know, a good sum for and that were very productive for us, they didn't do that by themselves. They did that with the help of our management analysts, our committee, and this council. And I think that that, that relationship should continue. I mean, are there things that we can do to be, to do things differently? Absolutely, but I do think that by spending that significant amount of money on that uh, lobbying team uh, to go down to Olympia and represent our interests, that doesn't happen in a vacuum. That happens because of an ongoing conversation, and I, from my perspective, um, we have a lot of really long council meetings. They run really late. We're all very verbose. I'll be first to raise my hand being guilty. But I would think that just in the interest of time, that getting rid of both the legislative committee and the finance committee or any committees is going to extend our meetings into the night even more than we already do. So I, I, I can't think that that's a good idea and I don't know of any one issue or any series of issues that came out of the committees that were so bad or so detrimental or so secretive or so nefarious that, that would cause this to happen. So um, I, I don't understand uh, more to what Councilmember Stewart said. I don't really understand where the, the motion's coming from or the idea's coming from, but I respect everyone has their own opinion and their own perspective. I would just venture to say that the, the finance committee has some very important things coming up as we talk about the, the oh my God, the crossover point. <laughs> we have you know, some, some major road infrastructure projects coming up on our tip. We have you know, a CIP with you know, the uh, Zacus Basin. We have, we have some important, financially important things that are coming down the pike here that we need to be talking about in a committee. And all the things that we deal with come through that finance committee. Everything we touch seems to be connected with some sort of financing behind it. So I would think that we should, if anything, not kill that committee and not kill the legislative committee, maybe better utilize them. Maybe have more people on them, maybe have less people on them. Maybe, I don't know what the answer is other than not getting rid of, or getting rid of them doesn't seem to me to be a good answer from my perspective. So with due respect to the people making the motion, I would think that we should continue where we're going, make changes as we're going, and continue to utilize, utilize the, the committee system as we have to have more effective council meetings and a more effective city council. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Yep, I've got, you, I've got you in the queue, Tom. Deputy Mayor Marin. Oh, this is Merrill. Oh, sorry. Well, then you're after Councilmember Hornish and after Deputy Mayor Marin. All right. But you're next. Ish. Ish, I think, I hope. Um, okay, well, I just wanted to point out that one, I was the one who said over a year ago that committees were a problem. And they continue to be a problem. Um, and that's only because and I, I saw it with the popular committees, and I've come to the conclusion that I don't 
I don't know if it's personality, it's, I, I don't, I'm not gonna try to guess what it is, but I, I think what it, the, I think what the, the big thing of each committee, of the, those two committees, is everybody wants a say in those two committees. Um, I think what happened with the legislative committee is it became the most productive because we got the lobbyists on board. The lobbyists, when the lobbyists were brought on board, that committee should have been looked at again and then decided whether it needed to be a committee anymore, and it never did get that look. Um, and it should have been looked at to be assessed as, as to whether or not that committee needed to exist or whether it should have been brought to a committee as a whole. Um, that, that never took place. Um, in my estimation, that should have happened then. Uh, the Finance Committee, you know what, looking at uh, the tip, guess what? I think every one of us better be involved in looking at the finances of the city because every one of us is gonna have constituents that are gonna want an answer. So, um, I think that's what has happened is those are two very important things as far as, you know, wasting time at meetings, wasting time. Every time something is done at a committee, it comes here and it is gone through again because we don't trust anything that comes out of a committee. So what's the point? Uh, so I don't, I don't see that it takes any more or any less time. Um, so. You know what, I think that if we want to do away with all committees, hey, I'm there for you. But if we're just gonna do these two to the end of the year and have it reassessed by uh, any new council that comes in, I think that's reasonable because I can tell you from talking with other previous council members, talking with uh, Ken Kilroy and then talking with another previous council member, you know what, that's what they did. Every council is different. Some work well with committees and some do not. Um, I don't think that we should sit up here and try to spit at each other because sometimes it works and sometimes it just doesn't. Um, let's just look at the fact that it just doesn't right now and let's move on, let's get to the end of the year and let's let the new council decide whether it's gonna work for them or not. Council Member Hornish. Yes, thanks. Uh, I wanna first address the innuendos that I'm the one that brought this up but I'm not on any committees. Uh, if you look at the list, I am on the Governance Committee. Uh, I am also on the YMCA Committee for Council Representation in those discussions. So the accusation that I am not on any committees is just outright false. And by the way, I'm attending all of my committee meetings. By the way, I'm attending and in one time for all of the Council meetings. And with this new scenario, I expect to even do more as a committee of a whole and participate in those as a council member for a council or for a committee as a whole with all the council members. Um, second issue, staff time, I believe would be lessened. Uh, Mike, I appreciate the memo. Um, I'm not sure it reads that there is, that you're gonna spend the time doing it anyhow, but I think there is incremental time to do the committee. You talk about doing the minutes. And if you add up the number of committees that we have, I think that does add up to a significant number of uh, hours of staff time. Um, and I have heard from some staff members that they do feel like they are repeating things twice and is not the most efficient. So I think this is a good proposal. Number three, I actually think it will help city council function better as a body for some of the reasons that council member Moran just uh, stated. Um, I think Council Member Ritchie even said, let's add more people. Well, we can't without an open public meeting. This adds more people to the committee, which is actually good as a committee of the whole. So I actually think we, we will work better together as a body and kind of addresses Council Member Stewart. How can we improve it and work better as a body? And then finally, I think it also adds the benefit of, and I think, uh, Mayor Malchow kind of alluded to this. We are now talking about it in a clear public meeting. We ask the other meetings might be public, but they might be during the day. People may not know about them, may not follow them. But if we do it at a meeting, I think the public would be better informed and get more information as well. Then finally, to say that our council meetings are long, all I can say is you should have been here two years ago. Uh, 2 a.m., going home. Uh, our meetings are not that long right now. I think we have room and we were running much more efficiently as a council. 
these days. So I think it makes more sense, especially with some of the hard questions we have coming up on finance and the legislative as, as have been discussed. So I will support this. Okay, I, a few more comments. I, yes, oh, that's right, Katzmar Valderrama, you haven't had a, a, a run yet. Oh, thank you for my run here. Uh, well, first of all, I don't understand the timing of this. We're now in- Council Member Valderrama, we're having a hard time hearing you. Can you speak up or move closer to the phone? Let me switch it off to this That's phone. Much better. Better? That's much better. All right. Okay, first of all, I don't understand the timing of this request. We're now in mid-July. There are no meetings in August. We only have one more, I believe, for July. December, you normally have one meeting. In November, you normally have only two meetings. So from here to the balance of the year, there are not that many meetings left to begin with for the council. Second, as we look at that and we look at uh, the timing of this and what's taking place here, the two that you're looking at doing away with are the ones that are probably the most productive and haven't been consulted. On the legislative side, we did bring in a consultant to help us. However, the consultants will tell you that they had uh, leaned on us quite heavily onto it. I made four trips to Olympia, accompany them at their request to be able to go out once with uh, some of the peers on the group. Others had gone separately. It didn't just happen because of them, and they constantly were going back and forth trying to meet with us in ad hoc meetings so they didn't have to go to the full council, and we would bring those recommendations to the council. By trying to bring this all the way forward to a full council, they themselves are nervous because there are some things they want to discuss in smaller groups. Additionally, I should point out that when these meetings for the legislative have been at the request of the council, open to all council members, specifically so everybody could participate in. And Mike can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but of all the meetings, only twice did anybody call in outside of the committee members. We did have some Marianne stop in on one or two. So there's been little enthusiasm for attending these. Also, the issue of staff time, and we've been talking about the staff time. Staff has said, as our city managers, it just caught them off guard, and it is going to include more time. They don't want more study sessions. Morale's already beaten down, and we're looking at adding more onto it. Finance committee, likewise, everything we're touching, and particularly with all the havoc that we've rested or incurred on our city, needs to be looking at how we're going to pay for any of this stuff that we're now talking about. Revenues, as I understand, are being looking at dropping significantly here. And as was mentioned earlier, our last city manager said at best we do a paltry amount at this council. He called this a do-nothing council. So we've got to look at how to be more effective, not to how to block any progress going forward. If you want to open the finance committee, just like you did the legislative, so everybody can call in. And I can assure you that in the next six meetings of the council, and probably only two more finance meetings to begin with, we're gonna have the same results that we had in the legislative. So it seems to be absurd. It's not saving time. It wasn't even run by the consultants or the staff before this recommendation was made. So I don't understand where it's coming from, what savings are coming out of it. Recall that in uh, at the end of the year, two council members, myself and Horish Hornish, are stepping down. Mao Chow is running and may or may not be back there, so you may lose almost half the council. Why not leave it for till the end of the year, let the next council deal with it on the retreat, which, by the way, for some reason, we didn't have a retreat this year. So again, as one of the things that we do to ourselves not to be productive, we, or we normally address these kind of issues. So I'm opposed to this motion just because I think we're wasting a lot of time here speaking about something when there's really very few left legislative meetings because they're out of session. And the findings, how many times more can they meet at most two? So I, I just find this whole thing absurd. Thanks. Okay. So I want to address a few things. Um, first, I, it was mentioned that you know committees were established to take deep dives on matters, and I think that's one of the reasons that I proposed the committees I did is because I am keenly interested in taking deep dives on those committees for both legislative and finance. Um, 
Councilmember Valderrama just mentioned that we didn't have a retreat this year. We had one scheduled. I'll remind you, it got snowed out, and our then interim city manager, Larry Patterson, wanted to wait until our new city manager was seated before we did anything. Um, it was mentioned about not understanding the timing for me. Um, this is, we're about to start talking about our legislative priorities for 2020, so the timing is perfect for that. And we just passed our TIP that identified some serious concerns relative to our future finances and how we're gonna manage them. Um, Mr. City Manager, we had our agenda meeting yesterday. You seem to indicate that there was some staff concern relative to time spent at committees. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, it is. Could you elaborate so that we could all be enlightened? Um, it wasn't really any elaboration on it. It was just uh, that uh, the idea being that what we talk about in committees, we rehash and we talk about it all over again at the council meeting. Um, that was the gist of basically what was said. And it wasn't uh, anything to slam anybody or do anything against anybody. Um, you know, the purpose obviously of, of committees is to gather information and do reports to the council. Um, but uh, yes, there was, there was a comment made that we go through this and then we have to go through it again for a second time with, with council. Um, that's fine, I mean, it, it, it is what it is at this point. Um, I just hope the council comes to a decision on what they wanna do tonight. So um, prior to the four other members of the council that are sitting up here with me, but Councilmember Valderrama and Councilmember Hornish were on the council at that time, we used to have a transportation committee and it was a committee I used to sit on. And because of these same things that I'm saying today, which are there was a great interest by the entire council for the, the projects that we were talking about. We talked about Sahali, we talked about Issaquah Falls City Road. Those were brought forward. There is no transportation committee anymore for that same reason. Um, and I'll be honest with you, when I hear that we haven't accomplished anything in 18 months, I think we've actually accomplished some pretty good stuff. We have a far better concurrency methodology in place, we passed some far better development regulations, and we've worked on stormwater, just to name a few. That is not nothing. Councilmember Ross. Yeah, I support, I support the motion. I think those are two um, key committees that need to be more active. Uh, legislative is very active. Uh, I think the full council needs to be engaged in both. Finance needs to ramp up on a regular basis to come up with an, a, both an approach and strategies to manage our uh, upcoming um, financial risks that we know about, the TIP, the CIP, everything. And I feel like the committees have lost their, their um, purpose. I think the committee always was intended to be directed by council to do a special task and then come back with that direction. Now these committees are coming into self-initiated work teams and that's creating the chaos, the confusion, and it's not representative across the council. Blind ambition of certain members seems to be getting in the way of productivity. So I am totally supportive of the motion and I'll just leave it there and I hope we can close this because I wanna go home to my guests and enjoy that. We got two more lights on. Can yeah. that be two, please? Yep. Councilmember Stewart. Well, I would just like to say, if, if that's how you guys really feel about the committees, then I again, I don't understand why you're not proposing to eliminate all of them, but you're just targeting those two. I think it's hypocritical to say that. Uh, to say that there's blind ambition, I think it's ridiculous. Just to be clear, all committee meetings are open public meetings. They are all noticed. All council members are welcome to come to all committee meetings. So people who don't come, that is a choice, but they're out there, they're noticed, they're on our calendar, they're on the website, and the, so that's just, you know, that's just silly. Uh, I do think that finance needs to do more work. It's fine, either way's fine, but I think it's hypocritical to target those two and to say that the others are somehow different or special, so. Councilmember Ritchie. I would like to offer an amendment that we include all ad hoc and standing committees uh, in, as a com committee of the whole for the remainder of this year. Second. Okay, the amendment has been moved and seconded. Our all debate is now on the amendment. Uh, Council Member Valderrama, you were in the queue. Did you wanna to speak to the amendment? Well, I was going to uh, mention that that task force for the YMCA, that ad hoc committee, affects 20,000 plus of our citizens. Ramiro, we're there. having the same problem we were before. Hard, hard time hearing you. you. 
Okay, hold on. Hopefully that's better. Uh, I was going to speak to the issue that's related to that, that in particular, the task force for the YMCA that we've had that was just mentioned earlier. That affects one third of our citizens. I do believe that should be raised to the council as a whole. That would be covered under the amendment as proposed. That's correct, and that's what I'm saying. That that one in particular, as part of this amendment, so I'm supportive of the amendment because I do believe that a number of these ad hocs now rise to that level. Thank you. Okay. Any more comments on the amendment? Okay. Seeing none. All those in favor of the amendment, which is to move all of the committees back to the council, say aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Okay. Five out of seven zero. We're bringing all the committees back to the council. Okay. We don't Thank you, uh, Mayor Council. Don't Thank need you. to do a main motion because the main motion is I move we adjourn. <laughs> uh, there's oh, I, I, I need to ask about council reports, city manager reports prior to it's a special meeting. It, I know, there, it's on there, so I'm just asking oh. uh, do oh. you <clears throat> the reason why it's on there, it's on there because that's the way the agenda is set. Form. But okay. if there's nothing under them, we don't discuss. I move Council we adjourn. Councilman Ross. Um, at the beginning of this meeting, uh, Mr. Suggs mentioned that the policy, whether we change the county policy or not, I recommend we don't, we leave it as is. And I just wanna make sure what's clear. I think- Well, my, hold on, hold yeah. on, everybody. We have a motion on the we floor. We do, we have a, so a motion. We need a second first. It's been seconded. Oh, it has been seconded. Uh, yes. Okay. The council yeah. member Ross had yeah. his light on before the motion was made. That, that's, okay. I just wanted to okay. at least call on him. Okay, so now we can have discussion on adjourning. <laughs> 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 okay, council member Ross, did you- Do you wanna- you got, are we, is the motion of adjourning open? It, it, we're, we are now currently debating whether or not we will be adjourning this meeting. Okay, um, <laughs> is it clear? I, I guess, speaking on my, that, no. My, I, what I can tell you is my motion did not include changing our council rules. Okay, so okay. I, I'm good, I'm good, okay. I'm, all right, I, I, all, I'm good. all those in favor of adjourning say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, by a vote of seven zero, we are adjourned.